In the last episode, we saw how not having an agreed upon healthy definition of infidelity contributed to Maria's emotional infidelity with Dustin. In this episode, we will see how failing to adapt to life stressors and balancing priorities, along with the discovery of Ryan's dishonesty about who he was when he entered the relationship, has impacted the couple's sexual intimacy, connection, and overall satisfaction. Let's take a look. The trust issues for me really started um, and probably a contributing factor was mm, two years into being in North Dakota, I guess. I was working at the hardware store. That was 2012, so it was a year. A year and a half or so into being in North Dakota, him and I have been together for three years. Um, I found out that quite a bit of what he had told me about himself was a lie. Okay. That, because I was trying to do something special for him, and I involved the sister-in-law in it about getting me pictures of a truck that he said he owned, and he'd driven all over, and everything else and she's like he didn't drive truck he we don't have his truck and moreover she said that she didn't want to be involved in any of Ryan's stories okay. and that was something that I never really processed I never really like drug that out and looked at it and realized how much it did shake my foundation with him But it did, and it still does to a point of, well, is this one of his stories, or is this, just, is this something that actually happened? Is this something that he made up? Is it, you know? How <sighs> to best describe myself to the both of you? middle child that never did enough, never knew enough, and wasn't ever enough. So it was, I've done lots of things. Like, I drove truck, I have cowboy, I have did college, I did Votech, I did all of these things, and none of them ever brought attention, no, I, honestly, I never saw her and I leaving where we were, where we are. Okay. Um, I didn't. It was. She was from Colorado. I didn't 
it just isn't. And then falling in love with her and realizing where I was at and what I was and who I am, it just buried myself. Somehow digging myself out of it over the years and realizing what a piece of shit I really am is. Horrible. Third question, what was the reason why you have created those stories? To be better. To what? To be better than what I am, what I was. And like I said, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not exceptional. I'm not anything to say, oh, hey, look what I got. I'm not. I'm not. I'm the end of the line kid that is just over there. Just don't pay attention to him because he's over there. That's me. That's what I am. I'm not exceptional. I'm not anything. I'm just I'm me over there. So, so the purpose of creating those stories was to appear special. Yeah. Okay. My dad worked a lot and he'd drive two hours one way. So he'd work ten hour days and drive four hours a day. So he never wanted to do anything. Understandably so now, understandably so. But at the time just look at me dad, just you know well, we'll go shoot, we'll go do this, we'll go, like, I can't even tell you how many years he told me that we'd go find the wild horses and in the spring and see all the babies, and that never happened, ever. So it was always really important to me, and he knew it. Say what you mean or don't say it. And... I honestly never processed it. It never even occurred to me that it shook me as deeply as it did. But after that, we'd be talking about something, you know, oh, well, you know, working this job, and I'd just be like, but did you really? And I would never say it out loud. But you think it didn't but feel like it. it was there. And... It's more recently in one of our late night talks and my getting to the edge of sanity and breaking down, I asked him one time, do you know what it feels like to have somebody say I love you and wonder if it's true? And that's how deeply it affected me. But I never knew it. Because that's what I love you means to me, is whatever, it's everything, it's I don't care what everybody ever thinks, what everybody ever thought of you, I don't care about all this shit that you just can't walk past, I care about you. What's the next major event in your guys' relationship? The never ending list of not done projects around the house. That was a major. Still is a major. Yeah. To start on one project, can't ever get it done. Because there's eight more that have started in the process. But then there's Tyler. Okay, so let's talk about Tyler. Mm -hmm. That's the first time that my wife has scared the bloody shit out of me. 
then I didn't know what to do besides be happy and jump up and down to the side of the hill. <laughs> and then be scared to death of God, how do I raise a son because I don't know how to raise one. You've done pretty damn good. My dad's not a prize. Your dad wasn't a prize. You know, getting awful close to being... Do you want that back? I'm getting pretty really awful close to being my dad. And uh, relying on relying on her to cover everything because these kids are scared of me. Till they're about four or five, kids are scared of me. No, no. And uh, so she told Mia to took care of everything. She took care of them. I think the only thing I picked out was Tyler's paint in the bedroom. But I'm not for sure. I think you even did that. Honestly, I ended up with postpartum depression and I just didn't know it. Okay. And I think that I've struggled with depression probably the whole time that we've been in North Dakota. Because it's, there's not a, there six months of the year, there's no sun at all. <coughs> and when the weather gets crappy, you can't go outside and the wind blows all the damn time. Yeah. <sighs> it's not good. <laughs> it's not the best uh, environment for it. Yeah, so I, I struggled with that and I didn't realize it. And, you know, my, losing your job at yeah, that sucked. United Reynolds was probably... I was pretty shitty. I was back to work for three days after maternity leave when they decided that uh, I was expendable. And they were moving the office to Williston. And my... Everybody in the office, everybody in the shop knew that I was the one that was doing all the work, that I was handling everything, I was running everything. Yeah. Even my district manager knew that my manager was useless. Yeah. And I was still the one that they did. But it, it really hit me. It hit me really hard. I spent the summer doing three different part-time jobs and having no time at all for with Tyler, which really sucked. And then in October, my boss called me and he goes, I wanted to be the one that called you and be able to tell you, I told you so, because I told all of them that it was a three person job, that they couldn't do it the way that they wanted to, that they needed you. Would you want to come back? Well, yeah. And so I went back for a little while and there was agreements made that was never fulfilled on their part. And it was 10 hour days at the office. I, I had to be in Williston at seven in the morning. So I was leaving the house at 5.30 in the morning. And I wouldn't get home until six, 6.30. And you know, you get 30 minutes a day, 30 minutes to an hour with your child who at that point was eight months old. I'm like, this is, this isn't working. I'm not okay with this. This isn't enough time with my child. Yeah. And I really struggled with, and I still struggle with mom guilt of having too much on my plate, you know, working full time, working more than full time at the job that I'm at right now. And, you know, the fact that my phone never stops. And then I have my own, I do art, photographic artwork and, you know, trying to give that the attention that it needs. And trying to have quality family time with Ryan and Tyler and everything you know, and all the chores, and I really struggle with the amount of work as I see it, and then once I get to that, oh my god, there's so much that needs done, where do I start, I just don't, 
Like, I just, I, I will check out, like, and I know what I'm doing. I'll just sit sure. there and screw off on my phone and 30 minutes later go, well, what did you just do for 30 minutes? Well, like, sure. when you're at that level of... And then that feed that cycle more because now I'm behind. Yes. And then, okay. And that's something that he's known about for a long time too. And hey, I need help. I need you to, you know, help me do these things. And oh. so let me pause here for a second. These events related to losing the job, the poor spot in depression, then the stress about going back to the job and being overwhelmed, right? Not having enough time for to do all these things that you have to do as well as want to do. How did that impact the relationship between the two of you? I think it put some stress on us because I needed him. I needed his help. Okay. And I couldn't define it, I guess, because I have my own misconceptions in my head of, you know, my grandma worked full time. And she still managed the house and raised kids and did this and that and you know okay. she was a badass so why can't I do it you know and wanting the help without having to make an issue of it because hey we're partners like this is but you know when I get the help it's it also kind of uh, the word escapes me. Yeah, I want the help without being having to ask for it, but at the same time, it's like, okay, you're still, but he had to help you, so you're not doing, you know, you're not handling everything you should be handling. Okay, meaning that if I actually ask for help, what comes with that help is that you're not managing your time properly? Or the judgment of you're not, you're not handling what you should be handling, you know. And it's also the caretaker in me of, I've got to do this and I've got to do that, and you know, I've got to, I've got to figure out how to do this because obviously it's possible to juggle all of these things and work full time and you know, be fulfilled and have family time and have this stuff on the side that fulfills me and like this, uh, I can do this, I just have to figure out how to make it work. Okay. And I'm not um, anxious, OCD, um, not OCD, um, ADD, okay. the anxious ADD, but I can, like, I can clean the house start to finish in two or three hours if I feel like it. Yeah. And it clicks with me that day. I just, yeah. done. Well, if you can do it on that day, then why can't you do it today? That, Get up, do something. That's with the voice in your head, or that's his voice? It's my voice. Okay. <laughs> and what about the part when you ask for help and he offers help? Does he offer help and sometimes judge you for the help that he's giving, or is that the judgment that you're making for yourself by accepting his help? At that point, he didn't. He didn't offer the help. No. It was. I was still kind of in maternity leave mode of, well, I can do this. Okay. And you know, going back to work and trying to find that balance of being able to handle everything. The, the, the times when he offered help, whether at that point of time or a different time in the land, timeline, was there any times where he offered help, but also with that help came judgment of you should be managing this different from him, or was that just all internal? I don't know that he's ever judged me for asking for help. Oh. It's, it's an internal thing. Oh. For, um, Try to get her to slow down. I don't... I don't ask for help because by the time I ask for help, it's crisis mode. And a good 90% of the time asking for help is, from anybody, is you're fine. 
You'll be okay. You don't need help. Stick tight. You know, write it out. The best recent example was I was on edge. I needed out. I needed a break. I needed the mountains because I'm a mountain kid. I just needed the mountains and I was going to go for the weekend and Ryan was trying to orchestrate it for me so I could go so I didn't have to worry about Tyler because it was his weekend on. So I didn't have to worry about Tyler and you know, trying to handle everything in the background for me. I don't fault him at all. He called my mom to see if mom would keep Ty for us and she called me and told me that you will be fine and you will wait to leave until I can take Tyler and like it didn't matter that I was in crisis and I just needed the hell away from everything so I could decompress before it exploded. So, so somehow you know that these experiences with that one as well as other ones led you to the conclusion of it doesn't matter if I'm crisis or not, doesn't matter if I overwhelmed or not, the message that I'm going to get it's fine, you can't handle it. Yeah, I don't. There, therefore, what's the point of asking? And it's not just help. Like, I don't ask for things, I don't expect things. I'm but, but again, what, what I want to the, make the distinction is that yeah. you were not hearing this from this guy. Right, no. Okay. Intimacy is the bedrock of any healthy relationship. One could argue that it is what makes our relationship with our significant others unique and special. Without intimacy, passion wither, and resentment builds. What changes the dynamic of the relationship? Lovers become co-parents, and the spark of excitement dissipate in the dark. Actually, but yes. It's the lack of sex drive between the two of us. Well, I ask, can we make love? And then it's just that it was a constant thing for her that would disappoint her drastically. Well, why do you have to ask? If I don't ask, it doesn't happen. physical portion of the relationship when the mental and emotional wasn't there and not realizing it was adding to her stress on top of it. So, so first question is at what point of time there was a noticeable change in the level of physical intimacy and then I will ask you to tell me your side of you know how you felt about those events. You know, it's kind of been that way for the entire relationship to a point, not at the very first, but... You'll have your chance. I know. With Dustin, during that, it slowed down and it got... There was more involved to it, yes, but it was... It was there, and then part of the thing is, is like I don't. Best person, best way I can put it is I don't listen to her when she starts to hurt her. I didn't listen, didn't notice, didn't. So there's that too, but like during the time before. I found out 
her and Jason were doing anything together, it was really bad then. Like, I couldn't even think about asking her because of the disappointment it would cause between the two of us. Marcel and me, because I'm just getting burned out of hearing the word no. So, that's mine. So, so, so again, before you get a chance to correct, just to kind of tell you what I hear. Initiating intimacy has always been a problem in the relationship. Uh, it got slightly worse after Dustin, but then progressively got worse and worse and worse up to the worst it's ever been at the prior to the, during the Jason event. And a lot of this has to do with uh, not paying attention to what she's saying and what she needed from you. Did I hear you correctly? None of it was on her. Okay. I don't, the, your last statement, yeah. it seemed like it came from her. No, none of, the, none of what happened sexual between her and I is on her. It was on me. I'm, I will say I'm the problem there. I don't know when to yeah. not ask or slow down and ask. I don't. That's me. I, that's on me. Okay. What, what was it what I said that made it really think that I'm saying that she's the problem? Because that's not what I'm saying. It, it was something in your last statement. I don't remember how you said it. I don't remember the exact words. But to me, it, it said, well, something about her and it, it's okay. I, hey, oh, no worries, no. Okay, no. I'm just defending that I'm not, no, this is on her. No. It's me, it's pointed at me. But, but, but specifically, how did you contribute to that? By not listening to her? Okay. Um, Which part you didn't listen to that caused that intimacy to decrease more between the two of you? Not paying attention when she was in pain. Not um, listening to her when she said slow down or that hurt or um, realizing when she was on her period and asking. There's, you know, there's multiple things that I know that I did wrong that I can list off. Okay. And it's, it's a lot of stuff and I can't blame her one bit. Okay. But it falls into the category of not understanding her need and where she's at and being respect of, respectful of that. Yes. Not showing her the proper okay. respect. disrespectful for me because I brought it to you that hey I don't like to tell you no because it makes me feel bad it makes me feel like I'm not taking care of you it's hard for me to say no because of who I am and that's where I felt like it was the disrespect and the lack of, of caring for me was I'm giving you that hard thing to say and I'm giving you that deep emotion and you're like oh well it doesn't matter because it's, it doesn't fit with what I want I want you and 
disregarding the fact that I would say, please don't ask me. And you would say, well, I'm going to ask you because the worst you can say is no, and it's okay for you to say no, but it wasn't okay for me to say no because then you would be disappointed. And as far as us having any dysfunction before Dustin or whatever, I guess that's news to me because there was never any issues that I was aware of except for the fact that I couldn't openly communicate with you and could that have contributed to me finding the connection that I did with Dustin? Yeah, it probably could have because I could expect the respect that I gave him back. And I give you the respect of saying, I don't like this. This is why. Oh, well, okay. And then you do it anyway. Your response? I'm not saying that there was bad between the two of us. It was me asking before Dustin. It was me not simply asking. Was it? But I wouldn't, even before Tyler, I didn't tell you no, nearly as much as I could have or should have. No. But I'm saying that that was part of my disrespect, because I saw it. I see it now. I understand it now. Oh, okay. Tell me more about the discussion of... Don't ask me because I don't like to tell you no, because when I tell you no, you act disappointed and I don't want to feel like I'm a bad partner or a bad wife for disappointing you, right? Mm -hmm. What was the alternative? When asked, then what, to wait for me to initiate? Uh, Recently, yes, let, let me come to you because when I come to you, I can, I can be there, I can focus, I'm perfect. centered, I guess. Per perfect, so that was kind of like the, the, the solution for like a better word, right? You know, you don't seem to be asking me during the time where I'm able and ready, right? Mm -hmm. And rather than you having to ask and being disappointed and me feeling guilty for saying no, wait for me to show up. This way, at least I can be present and we don't have to worry about all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. right? Or, at, like way back when, yeah. it was help me. Yeah. Help, like, I'm willing to try. But I need you to understand that I'm an, I might lose it, and if I lose it, then, then... Then don't hold that against me. Don't hold it against me, for one, and hey, let's go back to what was the last thing that felt good? Perfect. What was I doing? How, Perfect. how so, was I... So, so there were alternatives during yeah. that time? Okay. Accurate or inaccurate? Accurate. Okay. So how come these alternatives were not acceptable to you? How come you did not take them? Those alternative, it will hardly ever happen. Yeah. Accurate or inaccurate? I don't feel that's accurate, but there's also more to it, and this is speaking from experience, and this is really scary for me to want to bring up, but give me the emotional safety, and I promise you that I will be there because I know it works. Let me just be safe with you completely how I am, and I will want that physical contact with you. Like, retrospect, you know, full 180, look back down our relationship together. I always wanted to touch you, I always wanted to be next to you. We 
when we were living in the little camper, I always, like, we were always together. I was always touching you when I walked past you. I was always, you know, scratch your back, play with your hair, whatever, do all the things that you wanted, that you still want me to do. That probably, like, that slowed down quite a bit when I found out that you'd lied to me as much as you had. Because that safety went away. And it, it didn't stop completely because I know that I kept touching you. I know that we still have that really deep physical connection. But then when you really started disregarding my boundaries and not listening to me and pushing, the more you pushed, the more I would step back because you weren't hearing me anyway. And I didn't have that safety with you. And you, you think that this is all about me keeping what I have, and it's not. I want that depth of relationship with you. I've always wanted that depth of relationship with you. I want to get it back with you. But the reason that I know that that depth of relationship exists is because I have it. I didn't have it before, I didn't know it was there before. I can't bring these things to you that I've found because it's uncomfortable for you and it's better for it's better to just not. But that's what I want. I want to say, hey, check this out, this is really cool. Look what I learned about myself. Look at what I learned about like a relationship. I want that with you too. Yeah, but you brought it home from somebody else, and I don't care for that at all. Why did the sexual intimacy decrease between the two of you? When, when did you hear her answer to that question? Because it was a lack of respect that I was showing her. Okay, that's part of it. And that uh, she didn't trust me to listen. Keep going. And that uh, I didn't respect boundaries. Her boundaries. That's that's the same thing. Okay. Then I'm. I'm don't worry, then I'm, I'm picking you because I want to. I want to lead to that conclusion. I don't know. And just help me. What 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 key word do you hear her say? Related to this is what I needed from this guy to to be able to be physical. You need to let her be herself. Okay. Think about the timeline of the relationship and some of the major events that happened that affected her level of trust. If I apply to her. There you go. So, so if I have a formula as far as, you know, in one instance, okay, what caused decrease in sexual intimacy, right? It would be, you know, well, we need uh, emotional safety. Why did emotional safety disappear? It disappeared because I found out that he has been dishonest about a lot of things. I'm a person who value honesty, you know, uh, more than the average person, right? So I don't feel emotionally safe. And what made that even further uh, exacerbated that issue was what? Is when the two of you had those struggles about the boundaries and not respecting the boundaries, you had all these things together and equal like and those die for sexual intimacy. Ballpark?
Well, we listened to Ryan and Maria describe how they cope with the transition to parenthood and balancing life responsibilities. We can see how they found themselves being overwhelmed and at times too burned out to notice and address the deficit in their relationship. This was clearly illustrated in their failure to address the factors that impacted their sexual intimacy. Now the task of confronting difficult life stressors without having adequate communication and conflict resolution skill is already challenging. It becomes more difficult when you consider the lack of trust that has been created by Maria's emotional infidelity and Ryan's dishonesty, which was seen as a different form of infidelity from Maria's vantage point. I want you to pay attention to the cumulative impact of all the relationship events that you have learned about so far, and to what extent those events have laid the foundation for Maria's second affair. Until then, be well, be safe, and embrace the possibility for a brighter future.